Hi, um, thanks for the introduction. As Stefan said, I'm Stafford, and we met on IRC five years ago, and I've been keeping up with the open risk stuff, and everyone else has kind of abandoned it, but I think people still have lots of interest, so let me keep an update. Um, I live in uh, Japan. I work for a bank, actually. I don't work in hardware, but it's my hobby, and I just I keep it running very slowly. That's why you know you don't see many open risk updates, but I do get things done. Uh, I'm the maintainer of Linux, uh, GDB, and bin utils, and we did the GCC port last year, which was a big effort. Um, also, QMU is the emulator. I think we should get Renode as well, but that I'll probably have to contribute that myself. Um, and uh, that's a picture of Japan. So if anybody's in Japan and wants to meet people in open source, then let me know. And I have some, some friends there. And um, just, you're welcome. Uh, what is open risk? Has everyone heard of open risk? Anyone has not heard of open risk? Uh, everyone has heard about it. Um, that's the name of this conference, comes from open risk. It's a 32-bit core that's you know, fully featured. It has you know, timer built in, uh, debug interface, MMU cache. It boots Linux and all of those nice things. Um, we actually have three implementations. It's not like RISC-V where everyone has just built their own implementation. I think there are a few proprietary implementations of Open RISC, which I've, I've had people contact me offline about, but the main ones are the MOR1KX, and the OR1200, the, the original one, and then the new one, which I'll talk a bit about, is the Marocino. And, um, the one of the things about the MOR 1KX, which I'll talk about a little bit later, is the, the internal pipeline, the fetch, decode, execute, memory, and write back can be swapped out. So you can have a, a fast, um, I guess a, a high, what, what is it? Like a lot of features and be very fast, pipelining and everything, but it's a bit bigger footprint. Uh, it's called the cappuccino, it's a name of a coffee, or there's a, like a single cycle, core uh, pipeline as well called the Espresso. And they have all these coffee names. So the Marocino you know, came out of that, but I'll talk a bit about that later. So what has happened since uh, 2018? Last year when I was here, at the end of the year, this was the exact slide I had up that I said, you know, what do we want to do next year? And we want to finish upstreaming GCC, and, and we got that done. The other was, um, the open OCD, we have an SMP port for that, and I, I haven't even looked at that, so that was not done. Um, but the other was getting the floating point support into GCC. That got done this year, which I'll talk a bit about, and then GDB Linux support. So now you can actually you know, run open risk on Linux, and you can debug things, and it will not go into system calls and things like that. It will be just like you're debugging on Linux which is very helpful. Um, the other is we wanted to get glibc done, and that's in progress right now. I'm working on that. And then the other is we wanted to do a spec update. So we had a few new instructions, and one of them was this LADRP instruction. Um, I'll talk about it later, but we did that and, and a lot more. So the open risk spec 1.3 was released, which anybody can look at. We have some new instructions, and some more clarifications. And we wanted to improve the documentation, which, I, you know, that doesn't always happen. But um, I think we've, it, it's gotten a little better. So uh, my talk was really like, one thing leads to the other. So just from the beginning of the year, I had this kind of idea, but a lot of other things have happened throughout the year. And you know, at the, end, the beginning of the year, I thought, okay, GCC is done. Um, now I can finally get back to my goal, which is just, doing HDL design and just working on open risk and building some SOC. But then, you know, different things have happened. And at the beginning of the year, a company came, big company, I won't name it, but they're like, oh, well, you, you've got this GCC done, and we're really interested in a really small open risk core. We found this Espresso core, but it's not working. And this was something, you know, Julius worked on a long time ago, and we knew it never worked. But this guy, <laughs> this <laughs> These guys found it, and they're like, it's not working. Can you um, help us with documentation and testing? And um, 
I said, okay, we'll help you. We, we started to test it. I tried to um, do some continuous integration. It wasn't working, and in two weeks they came back and said, well, we're going to go with ARM, but you know, please keep us informed if you guys get more correct. A anyway, so from that I was like, well, you know, we really need our t testing in, in gear, and I started to create a continuous integration. Um, yeah, I'll go talk about this a bit more. Uh, continuous integration suite for open risk and all the different cores. So there's a lot of, in more more or 1KX, there are so many different configuration options and based on what things you specify, like if you want an MMU or you want a cache, uh, the test might fail. So I wanted to make sure that we could have a CI pipeline that could specify all these different iterations of configuration or pipeline, espresso or marocino or cappuccino or whatever, and the test would pass, and if somebody makes a change to something, it would you know, do continuous integration. And while I was looking at that, um, I found this Marocino, which hadn't been merged into the master branch, um, but it was, so it was another 32, it, it was actually a complete re-implementation of open risk. Um, it didn't really follow any of the same, um, the same, style as more 1KX, they'd redone the style, he wasn't really reusing any peripherals, it was all rewritten from scratch, but it was just in this other branch. Um, so Andre wrote this, and it's another coffee name, so Marocino is a chocolate flavored coffee. Um, I never had one before, but maybe when I go to Italy or something, I'll have one. But um, it's another fully featured set. We, we split it out of OpenRISC, um, out, out of more 1KX, and it's now in its own repository. But it has some interesting things. So it has 64-bit floating point. So it uses, uh, it's 32-bit, but it uses register pairs for 64-bit operations. It also um, implements Tamosulo's algorithm to do, um, you know, out of, I don't know, it's not out of order, superscalar execution. So it was, it's pretty neat. I, it's, and so if you don't know what is Tamasulo's algorithm, it was something that came up. I mean, maybe every, everyone has heard of Tamasulo's algorithm, a few people, half of the people. Um, so it came out of the IBM 360 or 390 in 1967. And it was this concept of having these um, reservation stations and having multiple execution units. So if you have a, a multipliers or adders, you might want, you could do those in parallel if these reservation stations, which are your arguments, are not conflicting. And um, that was pretty neat. It was done in 1967. But if you look at the Pentium Pro, which was the, um, the core that came out in 1995, which was the first, 19, around 1995 maybe, it was the first super scalar, scalar in, Intel core. There was ones before it, that, but they weren't using the Tomasulo's algorithm. This uses the Tomasulo's algorithm, and you can see it has a in-order fetch decode, then out-of-order execution with the reg reservation stations, and then you have your in-order retirement. That, that's pretty neat. That's a Pentium Pro. But if you look at like the Core i5, it's very similar as well. You have your um, your scheduler, your reservation stations, a lot more um, execution units and 97 entries in your reservation station and that, that's what we have in our processors now, which is kind of neat. And so the um, Marocino, this is the diagram I wrote to kind of figure out how it actually worked, but um, it has reservation stations, execution units, it has all these same components it's not as fast, like the reservation stations, instead of having 92 or 97 um, entries per execution unit, they have two, and um, there's just one execution unit, like there's one adder, one load store unit, one multiplier, and it, it works pretty well, but it's, it's not the scale because it's just in an FPGA, kind of a research project, but it, it, provide, it proves that you can do this. If, if you want to scale it out, it just makes FPGA run out of space really, really quickly, but it, it works. Um, in terms of performance, uh, it, if we look at the end results here, the cappuccino actually runs better, so iterations 
or made it millions of clocks so that the cappuccino can do, it has better pipelining. Um, but the Maurocino, we're actually able to run it at higher frequencies because each of the pipeline stages has been made a lot smaller. Um, but because there are so many pipeline stages, if there's a miss, a cache miss, or instruction fetch miss, it, it really gets delayed. I mean, the, I think the instruction fetch miss does a pipeline stall for like eight cycles or something. So that could be improved, but it was really a research project and it, it works and it can be looked at. You can look at it. Um, I don't know really of many other cores that you can look at a Tomosula algorithm. I think the Boom core is there and not, not too many others that are open source and available. So have a look at that. It's, it's pretty neat. Um, uh, as we were working on the Marocino, we found there were, you know, we were trying to implement the 64-bit um, register pair specification. That had to be added to the spec. We didn't want to publish the new core and have things that were not spec. So we, we created a new spec, but as we did that, we looked through um, all of the pending operations. Was there anything we could add to the Marocino and the more 1KX? And th there were a few things that we wanted to add to the spec. They, they're not all required in every open risk implementation. These are like class two instructions that don't need to be done. But we have the uh, ADRP, which is kind of interesting. It's basically usually the way if you want to get a, um, the program counter in an instruction, you would have to, in open risk, you would have to do a jump. And then you look at the link register, and it will say, oh, well, you know, I jump from here, so I must, this part of the code must be in this certain, in this link register address. But th that's useful for position independent code. But now, instead of having the jump and the read, there's this LADRP instruction that you can do that in one instruction, which is a lot more efficient. Um, and it's not a jump, which causes a pipeline stall, or so it's, it's much nicer. Uh, we removed one instruction, the remainder, which uh, if you ever worked on floating point remainders, it's, it's really hard to do in hardware. And no one had ever implemented it, and we just removed it, so no one would have that burden. And yeah, so the new spec is available, and lots of new interesting instructions and clarifications. Um, what happened after I had done that uh, continuous integration work and we had Marocino done is the uh, Google Summer of Code came up and we um, actually did some more work on making, you know, basically moving my Travis uh, continuous integration, which I installed my own Icarus Verilog and my own Verilator and Yosis and th those types of, I didn't use Yosis, but I installed everything um, myself every time Travis ran. We started to use the LibreCores Docker images and, um, and our tests will run Verilator, will run the OR1K test suite, which runs a bunch of different uh, tests to make sure the dividers are working, multipliers are working, loads and stores and everything is, is working, caches. And so that's nice. And then now we also have the new thing, which is every time we do a build, we'll actually track the resource usage and um, that's what Oleg showed yesterday, and it's it's very helpful. We haven't done many HDL changes, so that's why everything's looking flat. But um, we had an issue earlier where um, the memory inference on Xilinx was really high, and then they changed it, and then the memory in inference on um, on Quartus went up to you know whatever it, it went to. 4,000 gates or something like that. So I fixed that, and then hopefully now, every time we do a build, we can have this resource usage. Right now, it just does the lattice, um, the lattice synthesis, but I'd like it so it would do lattice and Quartus and, and Xilinx or whatever, the Intel and, and Xilinx synthesis. Right. So. So what I'm working on right now is the glibc porting. 
So we have a really old version of glibc. Well, why would we need glibc? We, we have uh, newlib, uh, we have uh, muscle, but you know, people still want glibc, um, even if it's an embedded processor. And, and it's getting, and it's helped us find a lot of bugs actually doing the glibc port. They have a really good test suite. So I'll go over these bugs really quick. So we, we had an issue with this PLT. Have people heard of the, anybody not know what a PLT is? procedure lookup table or link table. So usually when you're running your code and you want to call a function, if that function is in some other library, it will, um, it will go off and look at this PLT, but originally the PLT should point to some um, runtime lookup library, which will go and, hey, this function, func, where is it? And the runtime lookup library will look at all the loaded uh, shared objects and say, and, and write back the location into the PLT entry and then call the, the library function. So this is like a lazy loading. And um, this should work. And it didn't have an issue in, in newlib or didn't have issue in muscle. This is all set up by the linker. Um, but glibc it failed. But the reason why that is because no other libc actually uses a runtime lookup. They all just do it on boot up. And so we had this bug where Every time you call the PLT, it would just loop back to itself, and it would just crash. So I fixed that with like one line, which is when you write into the PLT, you should write the base address. So every time you get in, you should jump to the runtime lookup rather than jump back up to the PLT entry, and that fixed it. And that was not a glibc bug, but it was a, a linker bug. Um, there was another issue with uh, global offset table uh, lookups of variables. And so usually when you would load up um, some text, it's, it's always the global offset table is usually looked up as a program independent lookup. So your text, your global offset table is um, relative to your code. And you would load up, where's my code? Always my offset is it at this location if I'm at this part in the code. And um, then you could load that entry. Um, with offset. So R18 has your got, and then you can, you can read your variable x. And our implementation was actually using R9 instead of before it was having R18. Our implementation was having R9 as your result. And when you would do that, it, cl it clobbers itself. And that was because we were saying that this is a bit of GCC Lisp code, which maybe people would understand. But this is saying if you want to get the got address, then you should set the register that you want to put the got address into the got, um, the got value. And it was saying, well, use any register value, which for some reason it said, well, let's use R9. I changed that to any register value that's not R9, and then it fixed the bug. So the glibc port was helpful in finding bugs outside of glibc itself. So we fixed some GCC bugs and binutils bugs, and it's, it's working now. I'm still working on a few more bugs. And um, yeah, it's good progress. Hopefully, we get that done this year. So I'd just like to think there was actually a lot of people working on it. Um, thanks to Oleg and Andre and Olaf for fixing some fuse sock things that helped us get our um, get the continuous integration working. So we don't have to do place and route. We can just do um, synthesis. And Richard Henderson, he helped get the support for QMU upstream. And then next year, I want to finish the glibc port. I actually want to um, get back to writing HDL, make that small processor work. And um, there's also some work we want to do to get open risk SMP work into LiteX and improve the CI for more tool chains and Linux booting, not just the, the core, and also improve documentation. Uh, and that's my talk. So if anybody's interested in open risk, I blog about it on my blog, or you can go to the open risk website, or you can follow me on Twitter, or just send emails. Thank you.
So good, Stafford. I love it. Um, what was the original purpose for the uh, like double precision floating point stuff that Andre was doing? Do you know what he was up to with that? Why he wanted that? Um, I think he was working on dry stone benchmarks, actually. He just wanted to make it faster. So he wanted <laughs> to see if you, you can get faster floating point benchmarks. Um, yeah, right. I think it was his own research project. But it, it's, it's helpful to have if we want to do those kind of workloads. Yeah. Um, but I think it was just academic. Cool. And it's a shame that the, the Maraschino runs so slow compared to the Cappuccino. Yeah. You've, yeah. yeah. I think it's just that those long pipelines and it, it could be optimized in how this, you know, the branch misses work and things like that. It probably just requires a few, few tweaks. Cool. And, and the super scaliness of the CPU, that's parameterizable, right? So you can just have N like execution it's units if you want. It's not parameterizable right oh, now. Okay. It would need to be reworked. Okay. Cool. But Nice so those are really small, like this reservation stations and uh, register allocation tables are really small cores, easy to understand. So it could be made parameterizable. But, yeah. yeah, so if I remember correctly, uh, the original intent for going into re open risk was that you were building a synthesizer and just needed uh, a CPU in instead of doing the FSM in hardware. Yeah. So did you ever finish that? No, no. After I get all this, these tool chains done and working, then I can write a synthesizer with all this code and, and then just really small HDL core. Yeah. All right, thank you. Thank you.